So hello, everyone, especially Mike, since I see you online. Um, so this is the are we, April 14th, 2023 GW Coders. Um, I don't think I have any announcements. As we get close to the end of the semester, there are fewer workshops to announce. Um, I guess one thing to announce, and we can talk about it later too, this week, John and I uh, launched a website on using LLMs and um, scientific research workflows. And there's beginnings of a great collection of both examples and research people are doing on setting standards. For example, what settings you should have for your completion parameters around different types of data that you're using. It's hopefully where we'll get more standards going forward, but I guess now there are some norms being created um, and some other things. Any other announcements? Everything yeah. changing in the world. <laughs> Crazy fast. Everything changing, that's a good way to put it. Um, so with that, I'll go ahead and start sharing my slides. And I think it's the stack. OK, so what I wanted to talk on today was customizing um, ChatGPT to do interesting things. So I'll talk about creating embeddings and then how you can use embeddings along with ChatGPT to do what I think are some really interesting things and shows just some of the brief potential um, so this is what I created. Um, it was, I would say on a scale of things that are hard to code, this would go into fairly easy to code. So you can imagine that there'll be lots and lots more of things like this going forward. I think in total it was under 150 lines of code when I kind of summed it all up, which is pretty amazing. Um, Large part thanks to some great libraries, one called Langchain specifically. And then, of course, OpenAI has its libraries. So that helps a lot um, when you have a library that does the background work. And that's including the UI or no? Yeah. Right. Um, I mean, a hugging face UI is okay. pretty basic. Yeah. It's, pretty it's cool. yeah, there isn't much to do with that part. But I'll show the code in just a minute. Can you increase the font size? Yeah. Let me see. Um, there we go. Okay, so what I was interested in was mostly seeing if I could do it. And my question was, can I allow people to chat with experts on a topic? Um, a lot of my research is around the concept of needs and needs assessments. And so I went to there to build my corpus because I have lots of those files on my computer. So it'd be easier that way. Um, so the idea that I wanted to explore was this concept of you can pick an expert. So like you can pick Ingrid Guerra Lopez, who also writes a lot on needs assessment. And then you can ask questions and it would be trained with writings that include hers. I thought about doing like her own embedding model and then each expert would have their own embedding model. But then I ran into scarcity problems. Some of the people I wanted, I only had PDFs of some of their smaller works. I might only have like 20 pages of their ideas, which wasn't enough. Yeah. So for this, I actually just squished them all into one separate embedding model, um, which I'll talk about in a minute. Uh, but I can ask a question so I can say like, um, I do, how are needs, assessments and strategic planning initiatives similar or different. Um, and I can have it answer that. And so first it goes to our embedding model and then it uses ChatGPT to kind of fill in the blanks outside of what our embedding model has in it. Um, I also made it so that you could set parameters on your own. So flexibility or what they call temperature, I have a default as 0.7. So it's relying more on the models than it is on the creativity side. Um, 
ChatGPT, I looked it up. If you just go through the website, it's set at one. So this is a scale of zero to two. So I am a little more um, expert instead of a little more AI in getting the responses. Um, I can set the length of response, which is done by really token. Explain what that, that means, like how that is working. Like it's waiting so documents more or like, I, I don't know. So my understanding, and this may not be perfect, is so you know that ChatGPT is running off of probabilities of the next word that should follow. Mm -hmm. So your word is John. The next word, it has 100 options ranked by its probability based on the vector closeness or similarity. If I set it to zero, it will always choose the highest probability one. If I set it to like one, it will choose like one of the top 10 highest probabilities and it will kind of randomly decide within that range. If I set it all the way to two, it can choose pretty much anything of any probability. So you're kind of expanding or restricting the range of responses it has available. If you set it to zero, if that sounds very funny, um, you don't actually always want it to be the next highest probable word you want that variation in how it selects based on the context and so forth. And you're just loosening those parameters is kind of my lay understanding of how work temperature well. works. I mean, it, it, you get very different results. I mean, if you go, oh, yeah. zero, if you go to zero, it's much different than if you go to two. And one is a nice sweet spot kind of, of um, what I think most people would want. Now for this though, since I want it to be more of the expert knowledge, I want to limit down some of those, that amount of flexibility it has to produce responses, to take those higher probability because they're higher probability because I gave it training to push those probabilities up. Mm -hmm. So I don't want it not using the things I'm pushing it to use. I think that's a pretty good answer, actually. Yeah. Now, that's, um, that's, as much as, that's my understanding right now. It's pretty good. Yeah, so it does really well. Um, and so it answers as Ingrid using more stuff that she has written than others. Now, of course, if I had done her own embedding model, if I had a thousand pages of her ideas, it would be pure her. But since I don't, it's kind of intermingled with some of other people's ideas. And I'll show that in a minute. So that's what I wanted to build. Um, and now this is kind of how I built it, I guess. So in Hugging Face, these are the files that make all of this run. Um, so you can see these are the packages I'm using. Um, um, I'm not familiar with Hugging Face at all. OK, so I'm Hugging like Face <laughs> is kind of like uh, to, it's an interactive repository. Yeah, an interactive repository. It's kind of like GitHub. It's a, it's a repository where you just keep your files. You just store them there. You want to do some version control, whatever. Hugging face, you put some files on, and you can also run them in the background to create something like an app. So it's it's open. Like all your files to make this app is here, but it also streamlines a lot of things if you want to make a really quick app that's web based and you don't have to do much work to set that up. Yeah, and what's really nice is it's like other web provider services. It You can pay more and get bigger GPU access. So if you're training a large model and you want to pay $40 a month to train those models and get GPU access that you can't afford yourself, you can do that. That's how they make their money is selling GPU service time. Or you can use it for free like me and not do that. <laughs> um, but it's small. I mean, what I'm doing is small stuff. It's I wouldn't have to pay for any of this. Um, I won't describe what all of these do, but when we talk about the code, I'll highlight some of them. But that's the only packages that it's using. Um, the embedding model that I added with our own corpus of information is this pickle file. And it always gives you a highlight because pickle files are inherently dangerous um, <laughs> because you can run things within the file. So if it's not from someone you trust, don't open a pickle file. It can do a lot of things, but they're very useful and PyTorch uses them. So 
pretty much most things on here probably have a pickle file embedded, but they always give you these indicators. And then this is the whole of the app after creating the embedding model. Um, so as I said, let me see, there's a lot of white space. It's 182 lines with all the white space and notes and some things that I've taken out. So 160 lines. Um, and this then will create what you see and it creates those interactions. But first I should talk about the embedding model because that's really what makes it a custom version. I could, you could create this whole thing without customizing, but you would only have what ChatGPT knows up until to 2021 when it stopped its training and it just has that data. And it wouldn't have things like research articles that were behind paywalls or PDFs of books that I have because I actually know these people and they've sent me PDFs of their books. Um, so I had to create an embedding model that would kind of act as the interface. Now for this project, as I said, I'm just using the one embedding model where it gets really interesting. And John and I have been talking some about this is what happens when you chain multiple embedding models together and you can go between the embedding models and interlink. So while most people are just using the chat GPT model, you could stack three or four embedding models on top of that. So you could have mine, you could have one about all of John's writing, you could have one of all of Mike's writing, and then you can have it respond and use responses from one to inform another, to inform another, to create some really interesting dynamics. But this one, one embedding model. I actually did it in CoLab, again, so I could use their hardware since my computer would die trying to do a lot of these things. Um, but I moved it over to GitHub so that it would be publicly available. And there it also wouldn't have my API codes so that people watching the video can't steal and run up my OpenAI account. Um, so, I also wanted to do it in CoLab because um, I wanted to be able to, oh, let me, I won't show it here. So I can, um, I want to be able to link to my Google account because that's where I store all these files, like PDFs of books and stuff, because I have unlimited Google storage access. It's a professor. Um, through the university, I can store gigs of stuff there. So I have a folder already with tons of stuff in it. Um, and since you're doing it in Google Colab, you can link to your Google Drive and just pull the files directly from there rather than trying to upload them into Colab, have them use it there, have them tell me I'm over my file storage limit and all of that. So basically what this does, um, yeah, I'm gonna... So again, I'm pulling in some useful packages. Um, I am going to link my drive. So this little script links my CoLab to my Google Drive. So it now has access to that folder. Um, and in this case, I have a smaller folder where I have three books and about 15 research articles, um, approximately probably a thousand pages of PDF documents. So not a big corpus of information. Um, I pull in a couple more packages. I give it my API key so that I can access OpenAI. I'm going to use the OpenAI tool to create embeddings because I'm going to use it with ChatGPT. But if you go into Language Chain, they have about 9, 11 different embedding tools. Um, and they use different algorithms to embed. So depending on what you're doing, you might want to choose a different embedding tool. But I figured if I'm going to use OpenAI's ChatGPT, I might as well use their embedding tool. So I know they play nicely together. And by embedding tool, do you mean the algorithm which trains the language prediction model? or Exactly. So the embedding tool will create a vector model of my data. And by using the same one they have, I felt in theory, it's probably gonna work better with theirs. Though I'm not sure if there's any evidence that says that I couldn't really use any embedding algorithm. 
but it creates vectors, creates a huge vector database basically for my content, which then plays along with their enormous vector database, which is ChatGPT. Um, so I did this again, it was about a thousand pages of content and it cost me 40 cents to build, just to give you an idea of the cost. So it's not expensive. Uh, not, you wouldn't want to build one every 10 Inter minutes. Yeah. Um, exactly what I'll say interviews. You could <laughs> take a whole, all your interviews and do this whole thing. It would probably cost 10 cents. You know? So again, I linked it to my folder where I had all my PDFs. I brought those PDFs. Um, I brought all of them in in globs using the glob library. So anything that had a PDF at the end, I brought in. And the first thing I did just for ease was I merged all my PDFs together to create one long PDF because it was, um, I read somewhere that it's easier to create the file for it if it's using one file rather than lots. I'm not quite sure why that would be the case, but makes it for easy programming too. So I just append them. That's all this does, this PDF writer. One of its features, it'll allow you to append one PDF to the next. And now it gets a little more interesting. So in order to create the vectors to form the vector database, which is then the embedding model, I have to break up that PDF into smaller pieces that are essentially like semantic chunks. So you wouldn't want to break it down to every word and create a separate vector for each word, because what you're interested in is how the words are used in combination. But you wouldn't want to create just one vector for all 1,000 pages either, because that isn't very helpful. So you have to make some decisions around how big of chunks do you want to make and how do you want to break your data apart? For this, I did it fairly simply. I broke it into a thousand token chunks. A token is approximately a word, but not quite a word. It doesn't, it doesn't actually look for spaces or anything, but it, it approximates a word. I also allowed for some chunk overlap so that you don't lose semantic meaning. Like I don't. If a chunk ends on the word for, I don't want the next chunk to begin and not capture any of those previous ideas. So I allow it to have some overlapping of chunks. Um, there's also things you can use which are called stop indicators or sentence splitters, which kind of, um, you can have it break like it every sentence and have each sentence be a chunk. So. When you're creating an embedding file, these are a lot of the types of decisions you have to make. And I think what John and I are arguing for on our site is really, these are decisions that researchers should be very explicit about if they use an LLM, because it really does impact and makes a difference. So if I chose to break my chunks at 500 tokens and I had no overlap, I'm going to get very different vectors, so I'm going to get very different results as outputs from my model, and that could influence things if I was doing this for a scientific purpose. No, I wasn't, so I just kind of chose some basic ones to see how it works. Um, and, and then I had it split all the text based on that chunking. The crisis, sort of, in my mind, of like the scientific crisis, is there's no way to know what it's going to do until you just do it. Yeah, like you, you, there isn't a guideline, even a, even a common guideline, let's choose a thousand chunks and overlap 200 might work good for like, and this example, but like a totally different context, like querying information about qualitative interviews, you might need to expand the chunk size to get anything interesting out of it, or you might need to shrink it like, we have no idea, all you can do is like run it look at it and like try it and be like okay does this seem like good or not like that, and that's not very scientific like that's not a really it doesn't feel very good usually you want to i'm using a model i want to know the limitations of that model right away and this one we're in a very gray area now of like what can we actually do well and my guess is that it's like that in many 
academic innovations or scientific. Like when they first invented CRISPR, the first time they ran it, they just had to see what yeah. would happen. Yeah. <laughs> but now, years later, now we have norms and standards and we know how to. And my guess is yeah. we will get there where you'll say, I have a very large corpus. I have 100,000 PDFs that I want to use. Right. And it's in this topic area. Here are what the conventions are, maybe not a standard per se, but Got the it. common convention yeah. is kind of like when we do with skewness. We have conventions around skewness. We don't have standards. Yeah, like standards around statistical tests and when do you like? And some are standards that are pretty strict yeah. and yeah. some are more, like skewness always comes to mind to me because it's kind of a given, like, are those outliers? We don't have a yeah. specific standard that says, like, if your skewness is of this and you have this number of outliers, then you, you kind of have to make a judgment call and say, by convention, we would say this is too skewed to do this yeah. analysis. Optimization has very similar patterns of this where what's the optimal stop step size you should use in your algorithm We're like well there can be an optimal one but in some cases you might want to increase or decrease it to make sure that yeah. it mm -hmm. it finds the minimum if it's too big it goes past the minimum yeah. it's wrong and you, you trial and error sometimes like there's guidelines and people who are experts at using the tools <laughs> learn what guidelines work better than others and i feel like it's going to be like that here here it's just so new that no one knows <laughs> really, I don't even know if this is a good idea or not. Let's try and see, you know. But but over time, we'll we'll start to learn what's yeah what's the right thing to do here. Um, so basically, I split up that thousand pages of PDF into all these little chunks. Um, then down here, I passed it to the OpenAI embedding tool to create vectors for each of those chunks. So each chunk of tokens, a thousand tokens has its own vector. Each of those vectors can vary in length, but it's a set of numbers basically. And it can be like, most of them, when I've seen examples are like, I don't know, 15, 20 digit long numbers. And they might have anywhere from 15 to 50 in a single vector. So the vector might be this series of like, Point one six seven four three seven three next comma point two one four and it's just this huge string of numbers and each chunk gets assigned its own vector. Um, Wait, mystery. I'm like trying to think about it because like we're learning about the language models, or and I've spent time reading about them for this machine mm -hmm. learning class. But I'm like, this feels very different than like. A term document matrix where you have like this is this word and here's how many times it's used and like oh yeah like, that's more for topic yeah. modeling. I I haven't read much about like uh, language yeah. prediction models, which I think are different. And I'm like, is that like a vector in space? And you're like trying to be like this word exists here, and I guess so. Where you like it, yeah, and, like here are all of the words and like here's where they exist in some amorphous space. I don't know. I don't so there know are if I can like conceptualize it. So OpenAI does have on their GitHub page some really cool visualizations of embeddings. Okay. They kind of take you through both the code and then they create like a three-dimensional graphic to help you understand what the embedding is. I cannot explain it, but I can look at it and go, oh, that's pretty cool. I kind of get what you're saying. But it's not a topic I could explain to anyone. Yeah. All right. I've I, I heard a very simple explanation heard by reading Twitter. Uh, was to, I mean, it's it's a crazy high dimensional space, so you can't really think of it in the real dimensional space. But like a, a simplistic one, you might say like the son of a king is a, and you would probably say prince, right? Because it's like, but like, why would you know that? Was well, because the words prince and king are like closely together in a vector space than cat in king like you would, so the likelihood of it being prince would be just much higher so when you've taken that whole all of that stuff and you've created all these vectors and numbers out of it those two words are just going to be closer together in that super high dimensional space 
and that's all you need to know because <laughs> like that's that's enough to get the idea of like what it's going to then do with that but I, that's probably still not even correct at all like of what's really yeah. happening <laughs> yeah i look at the open ai on there i think they call it open ai cookbook <laughs> and it's in github it's a github book um and then if you go into like examples i believe they have things like visualization in a 2d visualization in a 3d and that helped me at least kind of figure out but at this point all it did was create vectors yeah. now for that to be useful you have to store that vector somewhere um, so these are called vector databases and they store vectors and they have algorithms so that it can quickly manage and search within that so it's very different than our typical sql database image where you have it looks like an excel spreadsheet idea this is a vector database so it is that three I and mean, it's this huge dimensional database of numbers um and so there are many of these they call them vector stores if you use langchain if you read about them they're called vector databases um, I read an interesting blog around how all vector data spaces are not created equal. Um, so there really is some difference. Now, the difference, though, is around, from what I can tell, is around performance. Oh, speed, yeah. It's all about speed. It's not going to actually change the outputs necessarily, but it's about how fast it can find similar vectors. Um, so it does vector similarity searching. So it's looking for similar vectors. So I use this one called, I guess, FAIS, and it has, it stands for something. It was created by um, Facebook, and it's one of the more popular ones, and it's extremely efficient, and it uses cosine similarity to find the similarity between the vectors. So that when you put in a query, it creates a vector of your query. So you say, um, when did the French Revolution start and who was involved? That becomes a vector. This vector database, in this case, face, it will use cosine similarity to find all the vectors that are close to the vector of your query or vectors of your query. So if you have a longer query, you have multiple vectors, and it does all that really fast. Um, and there are about a dozen or so of these vector databases that you can choose from if you're using the Lang chain. There'll be others beyond Lang chain, but Lang chain gives you 10, I think. I save that then as the pickle file. So it's that database. So it takes the embeddings and I put it into a database which has the management search query components to it that I then turn into a pickle file. Um, but it has the abilities. That's why I have to pickle it. I can't just save it as like a text file or something because it can actually do things. And that's what a pickle file is used for. Um, and that's why pickle files are dangerous and they give me the little red flags. So that's basically what I did to take that thousand page corpus and build it down into this one pickle file embedding vector space thing that I am going to use. Um, just playing around, you can query it directly. You don't have to pass it through ChatGPT. So you can query your vector database. Um, and it'll pull things just out of that file that you created. So if you wanted to build your own very small ChatGPT and train it on just a few things, you could just do this and it will pull the vectors and put it into order for you. Now, what ChatGPT do though, it'll fill in all the niceties and kind of make yeah. sense out of it yeah. because I only trained it on a thousand pages. How much could it really do with a thousand pages? So I kind of use it first and then I complement it with ChatGPT to make it actually sound more interesting and human. -like. And at the bottom here are the YouTubes and the GitHubs, a few of the ones that I use and I found most helpful. Um, the, the, the like the conversation of this is what I'm kind of laughing at because I'm like even just like two or three years ago like if you just pick off the keywords you were just saying you were like so we had like embeddings pickles and, and like 
and and, and you know pine cone database and stuff now in, in lang chain it's like a completely foreign language now compared to just just a couple yeah. of years ago of how you would do anything remotely related to this what i still find it's amazing like, is like how even if you read things from a few years ago no one was confident this would work <clears throat> yeah like no one knew that if you gave it enough embedding files eventually it could produce really human-like yeah. prose they thought it might but no one was sure until they built it and then they were like oh this really does do cool things um <laughs> I mean, I guess some people she, knew yeah. they gambled a lot of money and so they were very confident. But in general, no one knew that this would work. I guess the same is true with CRISPR. No one knew CRISPR well, would work until they did it and it did work. But the size they had a good hypothesis was also crazy. Like at GBT one and two kind of sucked. And it's like after <laughs> doing all of this, you still decided to continue to go forward with like even bigger. Like they were just like, just keep going, it'll get better. And like I'm just yeah. amazed that they someone kept pushing money into this, thinking like, yeah, it'll, it'll work, it'll work. So all the yeah. signs were like, it's not working, you know. Yep, but that's how good things happen. And what is it? Thomas Edison tried a thousand on. different filaments before he found one that worked well. So the urban legend goes. So the legend goes. Yes. Um, so now I'll go through what I do then with that embedding file and how it becomes this cute little chatbot thing. Um, so I have to have my open AI keys, obviously, and I have a bunch of packages, including the very important Langchain package, which if you didn't do any of this, it's worth beating up on it. And there's this really good video series um, where he just explains it in detail over like 15 videos, and he does an amazing job. It's you get done watching the video and you think you understand it all. Um, and then you get to do it and you're like, well, maybe I don't quite understand. But he does make you feel so confident, like, oh, that makes so much sense. Yeah. yeah. Um, so I have, and again, I like always with coders, I stole most of this. This wasn't all mine. I just made it mine. Um, so I start with an empty space. Um, it creates like a blank message and so forth. Um, so I'm using what I'm calling a prompt template. And what that allows me to do is create more interesting prompts to put to chat GPT and my embedding model. So if I go back to my files, I created this files. Um, which has information about each of the experts that I wanted to have. Mm -hmm. So the first one, Roger Kaufman, um, who was my major professor and is no longer around, unfortunately. But I tell it as part of the prompt. Now, this first part will become part of the prompt when someone has selected him as their expert. And this part says, like, answer as if you are him, answer primarily using things that he said in the embeddings. Um, and then I say things like some of the things he was really about. He had an idea called mega planning. He did strategic planning. And he liked to quote famous management gurus. It was one of his things. Um, for Ingrid, back here somewhere, um, I said that she focuses her work on evaluation and performance. She is funny and enjoys puns. Um, she hasn't figured that out yet. She's played with it, but I'm waiting for her to come and be like, why are my answers always have puns and riddles and stuff? Um, and then this third element of each of these is just what their bio looks like. Um, but this is the critical piece here in that this then becomes part of the prompt. So when we go back into the app and what's making all of this work. Um, I'm first just reading in that file and then I'm breaking it out into each of them separate so that I can put them into your choices so you can choose which expert you want. And then depending on which expert, part of that little gurus thing becomes one part of the prompt that gets passed to the language models. <clears throat> Um, so it's just some code to do, break stuff up, basically. 
probably could be more elegant, but it works. Um, so then if you change the prompt, I have it change the prompt template. Um, it also will change the description then of who you see their little picture. Um, now the important part here becomes this. This is what happens when someone submits a prompt, basically. Um, so I have to bring in their prompt, the prompt template that they selected. And as I showed earlier, I let them set the temperature, the max tokens, the content leak, and then the state is just the current state of affairs. So, um, and with the state, that's where I bring in the history of what they've asked before. So that it has that similar capability that you like in chat GPT, where if you ask a series of questions, it will keep getting better and better. Um, so I bring all of those things in. Um, I have here, if they don't put in a prompt, then to kick them back out. So within the OpenAI API, you can you have roles that you can assign. Um, so you have kind of like a system role and then a user role. And so you can break out that prompt template and tell them that's information for the system that's kind of separate than the query that's being posted by the user. Um, so like, for example, if you use, there are a couple of these tools where you can talk with historic figures. The system is being prompt in detail to create that personality and that is handled separately then from the query that you're giving it. Um, now, both of them end up going into the query, but there's you break it apart just so it knows kind of which one is telling it, like you should be answering as if you're a travel agent or you should be answering as if you were George Washington from then what is the separate question that the user wants. So then I open up the embedding file that I created. Um, now, I guess I should say, so if you use something like chat PDF, where it lets you upload a PDF document and then you can ask questions of it, it's doing the same thing. It creates an embedding file on the fly and then you answer questions against it. The reason I wanted to have a downloadable pickle file of this is that 40 cents piece. Every time someone queries it, I don't want it to charge me 40 cents to build a new embedding file. Now, if you're just embedding like a three page PDF of a research article or a six page PDF, it's like 0. 0.0001 of a cent. So that's why they can allow, they create a new embedding file for each document. And if I upload the same one 100 times, every time they're creating a new embedding file. Um, and this is what we talked about two weeks ago with the. Um, person who developed the one for YouTube was, did you want to save those embedding files so that if someone puts in the same YouTube video, you don't have to pay the mm -hmm. two cents or whatever to create another embedding of it. Um, when they're really small, it doesn't matter. But if you're working with larger, I mean, 40 cents isn't going to break me, but if four people do it, then you're at what it dollar 60 all of a sudden for have four people ask four questions and that's not 4, yeah so i just saved the embedding file and now i just bring it back in i string my queries together so i have that system prompt which has that system user tag to it the history which is the response to the prior question and then the new message which is that prompt message um, and it does a uh, similarity check through that um, using the pickle file. So the first thing it does is it does that similarity check using the cosine similarity to bring back out of my embedding files all the similar embeddings. And then I pass those embeddings onto chat GPT for use in the final response. So this little piece of code here still hasn't gone to ChatGPT for anything. I've just queried against my pickle file and said, bring me back all the vectors of things in my vector database 
that are similar to the query. And I'm using that then to seed ChatGPT to say, these are the things out of mind that you should use in addition to what you're going to use. And then the magic of language chain happens. So this load QA chain. So this is language chain lets you create these in many different ways. I wanted a question and answer. So that's why it's load the Q&A. But you don't have to do question and answer. There's like six different ways you can interact with chat GPT that language chain helps manipulate. But I wanted Q&A, so that's why I load the Q&A. They also do have one called Q&A plus source, which I think is really interesting. And I think that's what the presenter two weeks ago was using because he was able to then click on the link and it would take them to the place in the video that their question was answered because it links you back to the vector that it's coming from. It was one of the options in Langchain, but it wasn't necessary for what I was doing. So I didn't do the Q&A plus source. But I, in theory, what it would do is it would take me back and it would say like which article it's getting this information out of, in theory. Again, I didn't play with it. So then it goes to OpenAI and we set- the... Die soon. Oh, oh, you're right. <laughs> Let me get my charging. Like it's plugged in, but or it's not charging. Oh, there you go. There it goes. It, this wasn't all the way plugged in. Um, so I pass the temperature setting from the person, the max tokens. I tell it we want to use the GPT 3.5 turbo model. You could choose whatever model. I don't know exactly what this means, <laughs> but there are a couple of different options. Same type of stuff. Yeah, you can read about it in the documentation for Langchain. Um, but this seemed like the appropriate one, so I went with it and it seems to work. Um, but again, this has to go into like, again, you can have many of these embedding models and you wouldn't want lots, but you could have multiple embedding models and chain them together, which is my understanding why they call it Langchain. It's combining these language models together. And then it spits out the completion. Um, it takes the query, it takes the documents, it puts it all together and it gives me the response. And then I just append that. If there are any errors, I have some error messages and it returns it out to the image. Um, there's a clear function so you, you can clear your conversation. And then the rest down here, these last, I don't know, this is the user interface, these 30 lines or so. It uses something called, so to do a user interface on Hugging Face, you use this Gratio, Gradio, um, and that's what allows you to create this user interface. Um, and it uses Markdown language and it's fairly limited, but the idea is you're supposed to do quick, small things. You're not supposed to try to run your whole company server on Hugging Face. Um, mostly it's used, my understanding is for like creating machine learning models. Um, so if you wanted to create a machine learning model and you wanted to actually run it, then you could use that and use their GPUs and do all that on there. Um, but there's all kinds of stuff on Hugging Face. Um, I have no idea where they came up with the name. <coughs> but I don't know why that why that emoji. Yeah. <laughs> I have used it uh, for uh, embrace, like embracing your variables with curly brackets. Ah. <laughs> um, I use that emoji when I teach in well. In the tidyverse, when you you can write functions that way, you put double double curlies around it. So I use the hugging face thing to remember like what to remember to do. I don't know if that it is here. It's very um, but a very useful resource if you want. Again, GitHub is static. This is dynamic. So if you want to do something with what you have on Git, um, this would be the place to do that. Though I'm sure Git probably offers something like this now. 
Why wouldn't they? Yes, so that's what I developed. Um, hopefully it's useful. It was, again, I'm, I've never taken like a coding course formally. I'm not a computer scientist. This was like two evenings of work maybe three evenings of work, just playing with things. And that still amazes me too, is just how easy some of this yeah. stuff is. Yeah. It's not magic. It's, and anyone can do it. I mean, it's, no, a lot of that. <laughs> oh yeah, I mean, the, the vector space and who thinks of all those things, that's pretty yeah. wild out there. Very smart people, thank goodness for it's, them. It's already so modular. Right? That's the thing. It's like everything is just mod modules that you're just kind of connecting together. It's um, mm -hmm. incredible how easy it is to put this stuff together, given how new it is. It's and then this is the site that John and I developed. Mm -hmm. And the reason I want to show it here is we I, have- I, a... I wrote you messages on Slack about it. <laughs> like I did not- <laughs> I did not build anything. Yeah. So we have uh, we're building out a resource database kind of to bring these things together. So it's a database where people can upload stuff, um, documents. So these are documentations that might be useful. Um, there are some tutorials of how to do some of this, and anyone can add to the resource. You just post it, and then we'll clean it out. But maybe most importantly, I think right. This is really interesting. We started this checklist of things that reviewers should be looking at. So if someone uses an LLM as part of their research method, did they tell you what temperature they set it at? Did they tell you how many token limits? And if you set it to unlimited tokens or 2000 tokens or whatever, ChatGPT will just start making stuff up to fill the space. Yeah. If you set it to a hundred tokens, it's just gonna give you the best stuff. So those decisions are all important if you're using this in scientific workflows. Um, so starting to set out what some of those norms should be that may later become conventions and later become standards. Yeah. But we have to start somewhere with saying, at least this is what I expect to see in an article. Kind of like if someone submits a regression or an SEM article, there are 10 things you know you want to see in that article that if they don't mention it, you're then a wonder, did they know what they were doing? Yeah. Um, so I think having that is a good starting place. Which, Mike, this is what we've been talking about. Like, I mean, we, we've been talking about doing some of those, uh, what's the word, sort of groundwork for this, like in a particular context. Like if you wanted to do sentiment analysis with this, then what is the sort of, best range of parameters you should be using and how, what's the best practice for getting good results out of it. You might get really poor results if you don't set those correctly and research needs to be done on that. Like we need to actually do some of these things, test it and see are there any generalizable outcomes we can get on best practices. And um, well, I think in yeah. establishing what the benchmarks are, yeah, like, even just that. Like, how I, would you know if it's best practice? It? Yeah. You have to have some benchmark that you're saying, this yeah. is the ideal. Um, and I don't think the ideal is always kind of at the human. That article I sent you the other day, like the, or I guess it was yesterday, the eight things to know about LLMs. Yeah. One of them is that um, they're not human intelligence isn't their boundary. Like we always compare them everything back to human intelligence. Mm -hmm. It's a different type of intelligence and we shouldn't think of it just in terms of the boundaries, always comparing it against human performance. Yeah, It may just do really well at things that we don't do well, way beyond what our expectations yeah. are. Um, and yeah. other things it won't, obviously, like <clears throat> it, a language model doesn't do well at math. Go figure, it wasn't made to do math. My car doesn't fly. It wasn't made to fly. It does something different. Um, yeah. So I it think also does figuring things that, out. that are, I think, I mean, when you see something that looks nonsensical, it might only be because you're a human looking at it. And this is like, like chess is the great example of this, where there's certain principles that like 
you tend to follow because most of the time you're playing a human. And if you want to beat a human, there's some clear strategies you should do. The computer then will just be like, I'm going to do this stupid move that you any any chess player would look at it and be like, that's idiotic. Like, that's such a dumb move. And then like 35 moves later, you see why they did that and they won. <laughs> and it's just, it looks nonsensical to you because you're at the limit of human knowledge. And this thing is so far beyond you. It can see things into the future, what you're going to do that you just did not see. And that's probably what we're going to start seeing here too. We're going to see it doing things that look nonsensical to a human, but it's like, no, trust me, I'm, I'm better than you at this. I <laughs> feel like, yeah. <laughs> anyway. Well, hopefully that was useful. Um, I'll go ahead and stop the recording. Double pawns. <laughs>